Last week, we looked at the picture story in Numbers. We looked at the picture story in Numbers 21. And the story is of the children of Israel that sinned against God. They rebelled against God's word. They rejected the manna and they complained that there was no bread. And the Bible said immediately God sent serpent among them. As the serpent began to bite them, they came to Moses and said, we have sinned against God. Pray to God to take away this serpent from us. And as Moses prayed, God told Moses to make a serpent of bronze and raise the serpent of bronze up. And as many as will look up to that serpent of bronze, they will be healed. That tells us the importance of that symbol. That brazen serpent that was raised up is a symbol of Jesus on the cross. And Jesus refers to that in John 3, 14 and says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whosoever believe may not perish, but have everlasting life. Today, I want to talk about what comes after the cross. In other words, what does it mean for us to believe? What is expected of us as Christians? What comes after the cross? We know before we come to the cross, we are sinners by nature. What comes after the cross? What is expected of us? And how do we fulfill this expectation? And Paul the Apostle summarizes that in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. The first thing I want us to understand is, thank God Christ has died for us. It's such a beautiful thing. The gift of eternal life has been provided to us. There is a little... There is very little benefit we will enjoy if we don't understand this gift. It's like somebody gives you a package and he tells you this package is so precious. Please handle it with care. Don't use a knife to cut the package. You know, don't throw it on the floor in order to open it. Just handle it with care. And because the package is so precious, You've looked all around the package. There is no lid you can open. There's no, you know, there's no instruction on how to open the package. That package sends confusion to the receiver's mind because on the one hand, he's afraid to damage the package in the process of opening it. And on the other hand, he has to open the package to know what is inside. In other words, ignorant of what the package is and how to open it is a big dilemma for that fellow. The same way the biggest hurdle we have as Christians is ignorant of what God has called us to be and how to become that. I think if there's anything we need to be reminded of again and again is what God has made us to be and how we are to go about it. It is so, so vital. Jesus spoke about this a lot of times. For instance, in John 8, I think verse 12, it says, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. A lot of things that Jesus taught about might not be easily understood, because Jesus Christ himself is the forerunner of the New Testament. In other words, the New Testament proper begins from the death and resurrection of Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are in the New Testament according to the placing of the Bible. But the New Testament dispensation itself 
began from the act of apostles. The New Testament dispensation, the way God began to, you know, the basic difference between the Old and the New Testament dispensation is how God is dealing with Israel. Old Testament, Israel was the representative of God. Israel are the chosen of God. In the New, we are the spiritual Israel that God has chosen. All his children are the spiritual Israel. That's why the Bible says there is neither male nor female, there is neither Jew nor Greek. You understand? We have, we are, we are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So under the New Testament, we are all Israel. Peter says we are a chosen generation. First Peter 2 5 a holy nation, a peculiar people, you know, so we are the saints of God in the New Testament. And it is of great importance for us to understand exactly what we have been called to be and how we are to go about it. So Romans 12, 1 starts with a plea, a plea. Now, I want to encourage us to read the whole chapter. It is Field. It is filled. It is filled. And the summary of the whole chapter is in Romans 12 1. A lot of things we might not, we might have questions about are all written in the whole chapter. Let me just run through it. Verse 3, I say unto you, through the grace of God given unto me, that every man, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't be proud. Because we all belong to the body of Christ. He says, don't be proud. Even if you are ministry, don't be proud. Do it with joy. And so on. Verse 8, he that, he that exalted on exaltation, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruled with diligence. He that showed mercy with cheerfulness. Nine, let love be without deceit. Dissimulation is deceit without hypocrisy. You know, so I want to encourage you, read Romans 12, verses 1 to the end. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. This book is so rich but there is one thing that Paul Paul in verses 1 and 2 tells us two things that we must understand as Christians he starts his exhortation with a plea I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God now Romans is a doctrinal passage Romans 1 to 11 he has explained who a Christian is. So as it were here, he's now giving a summary of the duty of a Christian, what God has called a Christian to be, and how that Christian will be what God has called him to be. So he says that as Christians, we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Paul is saying, in other words, let's dedicate our life to pleasing God. In the Old Testament, they had the duty of bringing a sacrifice. They put a lamb, a, an animal on the altar. That animal is born as a sacrifice to God. So that's why Paul is using a symbol here. That's why the word living is behind it. We are not to burn ourselves on the altar physically, but we are to be a sacrifice, a thing devoted unto God, but alive. Meaning we are to devote ourselves unto God, spirit, soul, and body. We are to devote our life to God. Before the cross, our mindset was to please me, myself, and I, to do things that pleases us. But after the cross, our mindset is to do things that pleases God. 
to do things that pleases God. Yerubah say, a good name is better than silver or gold. The Bible version of that is a good Christian name is better than silver or gold. The name of Christ is to be protected, not the name of myself. So Paul is saying we are to focus ourselves on God. We are to focus on knowing God and pleasing him. We are to focus on knowing God and pleasing him. Now, he uses some adjectives to describe this living sacrifice. I've explained the sacrifice. We are simply to devote ourselves to pleasing God, to knowing and pleasing God. Because there is no way we can please God if we do not know him. This is why Paul, the apostle, after all this, all his experience in God says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. There is no way we can please God when we do not know him. Every activity we do for God is a function of the knowledge of God. When we have a wrong knowledge of God, we have the wrong mindset of God, all our services are in vain. Because knowledge is a vital thing in the kingdom of God. Because the knowledge sometimes sounds complicated to those who have not understood it, to those who have not been working with the spirit. Typical example, we are saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. That is 100% true. If I'm asked, why will God let me to heaven? My answer is straight and simple, because Jesus Christ died for me, and I am trusting in him to save me. But that trusting in Christ to save me has to come with a desire to know Christ and to please him, to do what glorifies him, to do things that give honor to his name, to think and to do things that give honor to his name. In other words, that trust that I'm placing in Christ has to be total and complete, must be total and complete. If I have unforgiven spirit, I am not humble. God has forgiven me, but those that offend me, I'm not humble enough to dish out forgiveness to them. Then I have not understood. I am not trusting completely in God. Trusting completely in God is us having the mindset and the readiness to do the things he has told us to do. That glorifies him and sometimes humiliates and humbles us. That is it. Those things can sometimes be complicated. What I'm trying to say in other words is the grace of God. It is true we are saved by grace through faith. But that grace and faith would manifest in works and lives of righteousness. The works and life of righteousness is not the evidence of salvation. It never can be. It is the grace of God and the evidence of salvation. It is the grace of God. But we all know grace comes with truth. A heart that does not know truth or that has rejected the truth cannot claim to be that God's grace is operating there. Grace comes with truth, and that truth will have effect in the heart. And the fruit of truth is righteousness. So even though we are saved by grace through faith, those things will manifest the true fruits of love and fruits of righteousness. It is very, very important we understand that. So he says we should be a living sacrifice. We should dedicate ourselves to God. And then comes a few adjectives. Holy, acceptable to God which is our reasonable service. If you've ever been wondering what has God called you to do, 
What has God called us to do? He has called us to focus on him. Jesus says, you that will come after me, let him deny himself, take off his cross and follow me. He's simply saying, Daddy, devote yourself to me and learn from me and begin to walk the way I have instructed in my world. To be a living sacrifice is to be devoted to God. To gradually focus on pleasing God and worshiping God. And by the way, that's the greatest form of worship, which is your reasonable service. That word service there can be replaced with worship. Now, Paul is using a few things here. He says, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. As long as God's grace is the one doing it, it is acceptable to God. The word holiness, we can replace it with dedicated. We can never be holy like God because we are in the flesh. But if we are set apart, we are dedicated to God, then God accepts us. Now he goes to verse 2, and he now tells us exactly how to achieve this life of devotion to God. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. First, the adjectives good, acceptable, and perfect, they are adjectives. That does not mean the will of God is three, good, acceptable, and perfect. It is one. These three things are just used as adjectives to qualify it. The Bible could as well say that ye may prove what is that good will of God or what is that will of God because God's will cannot be bad. So they are adjectives. It doesn't mean God has three will. No, it is one. Good, perfect, and acceptable adjectives. That's number one. The will of God. How do we explain the will of God? It's simple. What God wants you to know and what God wants you to do. What God wants you to know. We can... There are a lot of things God wants us to know. There are, since God is always speaking, he has spoken through his word that has been written down. And any other thing he's going to say would be in line with his written word. God's will is what God wants us to know. What God says is right, is the truth. That's the will of God. For instance, it is through the will of God, what God says, that we know we are sinners by nature, that we know that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. It is through the will of God that we know that Christ has saved us, as many as have repented and have called on him to save us. It is through the will of God that we know. It is through the will of God, the revealed will of God, what the standard of God, the law of God, that we know that marriage is consists of a man and a woman coming together and no more, not two men, not two women. It is through the will of God that we know this thing and so many other things. It is through the will of God, the word of God, that we know that men ought to love their wives and wives ought to submit to the husband. So we can be devoted to God. We will be a living sacrifice in practical sense when we notice two vital things. It says, be not conformed to the world. There are two things I want us to know. God's word or God's will is here, for instance, and the standard and the instruction of the word is here. It's directly opposite to God's will and God's word. What God says 
is on one side. The standards, the instructions from the world and the, the let me say the do's and don'ts of the world is directly opposite to the do's and don'ts of God's word. I'm just using that paraphrase so that we get an idea. The thing that God says we should do, it is the direct opposite that the world says. God says marriage is for a man and a woman. The world says no. God is too rigid. You can have variation. We are not, the world is saying, we are not opposing God's own, but we can add to it. There are variations. So the other two variations is man and man, woman and woman. And it is not for the world to decide what marriage is. God ordained it, not man. God's word says, that we need Jesus. The word says, no. We have Islam, we have Buddha, we have Hare Krishna, we have Olumba Olumba, we have Mormonism. We have, how can you be so, how can you be pushing your own alone? That's what the word says. So you see that God's word, God's do's and don'ts, his standard, his laws is one side, on the other hand, the ones of the world are on the other side. And God is saying, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, meaning gradually let your mind change, let your thinking be changed by the word of God, so that you will know his will that is good for us, that is acceptable to us, and that is perfect for our relationship with God in making us become a living sacrifice. God is saying, in other words, if we want to be totally devoted to him, if we want to be who he has called us to be, a living sacrifice, totally focused on following God, we want to be his disciple in these days that is walking with him, just like the 12 did. We need to learn to embark on the journey of knowing God's word, focusing on it, renewing our mind with it, and doing what he says, so that we will know it. The purpose of knowing God's good and acceptable and perfect will is so that we can practice it. In other words, number one, what has God called us to be a living sacrifice? We should devote our life to him. Just as the 12 disciples left everything and they followed Christ. We don't have a physical Christ to follow, but we can follow his word. We can devote our life to him and let every other thing we have in our life be a secondary thing and our work with him be primary. How do we do that? We let God's word gradually change our thinking. We don't conform to the world. We don't learn the things of the world. On the other hand, we allow God's word transform us so that we can know is good, acceptable, and perfect we. One we that has that three adjectives that they used to describe in order for us to do them. And how do we do that? Jesus tells us, John 8, we should continue in his word. We should continue in his word. He says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. John 8 verses 30 to 36. We can write that down. We continue to study his word. We read it with our eyes. We read it with our mouth in confessing it. We read it with our eyes. We read it with our mouth in confessing it so that our ears will hear it. And then we pray and ask God to help us to do the word. And that is the summary and totality of what God has called us to be. That is what being a Christian is all about. That is what being a Christian is all about. That is what being a Christian is all about.
Paul is starting. There, there, there could be a question somebody will ask here. If this is God's will, why is Paul beseeching? Why is he begging? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Why is he starting with an appeal? Why is he starting with an appeal? Why does he not command? I have a few Bible translations here amplified. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God. New Living Translation, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, I plead with you. English Standard Version, I appeal to you therefore brothers, why all this appeal? Why did he not just command? Why is he appealing? The command of God is born out of law. Paul the Apostle understood this. It's born out of love. Right before we were sinners, God had been appealing to us. Christianity is not by force. But you will be appealed to by God. God has been appealing to us right since we were conversant with our nature, right since the day we began to hear God's word that we should come to him, he loved us, he made us. He has been appealing to us because he loves us. The same way he will continue to appeal to us. And the same way, the same spirit are appealing to us to understand that this is what the word of God says. This is what we need to learn and focus on. Thank God for the privilege of singing in the church. Thank God for the privilege of preaching. Thank God for the privilege of working for him. Thank God for the privilege of helping the poor. Thank God for the privilege of helping the widow. Thank God for the privilege of doing so many other benevolent things. But when we do all those things, and we don't have the foundation and the right motive of doing those things. All those things have of no effect. Except we understand that this is the primary thing that God has called us to be. After the cross, this is what God expects from us. After the cross, God expects us to devote ourselves to him, no more to ourselves. That's why the Bible says, Matthew 7, 21, it says, not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord, shall enter into my kingdom, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. So in the same spirit of Paul, I'm appealing to us. Let us grow in this grace. Let us grow in this grace. Let us ensure we are growing in our calling. We devote ourselves to God. Let's ensure we are growing in our duty of calling on him in the daily prayers. Let's ensure we are growing in our duty of praising him. And I want to strongly recommend to us the hymns we have been singing, they are a very beautiful instrument of prayer. <clears throat> they are a very beautiful instrument of prayer. What other prayer can be as good as you praying? Renew my will from day to day. Strengthened with thine, 
strengthen it with thine and take away all that makes it hard to say. Blend it with thine and take away all that makes it hard to say, thy will be done. My God and Father, while I stay far from my home in life's rough way, oh, teach me for my heart to say, thy will be done. If thou should call me to resign, what most I prize is near was mine. It was never mine. I only yield thee what was thine, thy will be done. Let but my faith not be blessed with thy sweet spirit for his gifts. My God to thee, I leave the rest, thy will be done. I want to encourage us to use this hymn, not only to sing, but to pray to God. Because after the cross, we are expected to grow in the fruits of the benefit of the cross. Christ understands before we come to the cross, we were sinners. We focused on ourselves. But right now, the evidence that we have been to the cross, we have been washed, we have been saved, our heart has been turned around is when we grow in the grace of God. And the grace of God operates with the knowledge of his word. And the effect of that knowledge is to change our mind, to change our thinking, so that we can become more like him and less like us. He must of a necessity increase in us. God must increase in us and we must decrease. This is what is expected of us after the cross. No matter what we do, if we don't grow in God, if we don't shine, we don't burn on the altar as a living sacrifice, proverbially, then the whole benefit of the cross, we are not experiencing it. And like I started from, Christianity is where you cannot afford to be ignorant. You can just not afford to be ignorant. You can, we cannot afford to be ignorant. I remember for many years, I personally began to preach that Titan is a thing of free will. There is no cost to anybody that doesn't pay tithe. It is a thing of free will. It is only recently that big time pastors have begun to, specifically an American pastor, Crefu Dollars, confirm that, that he has been teaching heresy all these years. We cannot afford to be ignorant as Christians. And I want to encourage us finally. We must have regard for God's word than the word of any man. Lest we become idolaters. The first commandment is thou shalt not commit adultery. There is no greater adultery than when hundreds of thousands of people gather together. They are listening to a man that is teaching them his whole version of God's word, but they have failed to study that word to see that that man is leading them in the wrong direction. That is adultery. That is idolatry. They have made an idol out of that man because they have simply refused to look at the truth themselves. No man is superior to any man. When we read Romans 12, Paul is admonishing that nobody should be to see himself higher than he ought. Verse 3. He says, don't think highly than you ought to think of yourselves. So no matter who a man is, pastor, reverend, whatever title he gives himself. He has no right to think of himself highly than God has placed him. Because it's not higher that is, that is leading 100,000 congregation does not mean it's, it's more important than every single man in that congregation. No, 
God has called him to teach the truth so that his church can grow. And we, the church of God, God has called us to, to go into the public place, to pick the word of God, write the scriptures down, and study them ourselves so that we too can shine for God on our own private altar. Our sacrifice for God will continue to burn, not physically, but figuratively. He says we are called to be a living sacrifice. Sacrifices are always burning. So God expects us to burn for him. That is fire of the spirit will operate within us. This is our calling after the cross. This is our calling after the cross. The only way we can do that is when we renew our mind and follow the will of God. Jesus said to his disciples as I tried to close, if you continue in my word, then you are truly, truly, he uses the word indeed, he says you are my true and practical disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. That's exactly in the same spirit Christ is writing this thing. Meaning we progress in knowing his word, the do's and don'ts, his laws, his standard, the things he tells us to do and not to do. Is There are so many adjectives used to describe God's word, God's will, God's standard, God's... Um, um, God's... Um, the law of the Lord is perfect. You go into the psalm, you see so many adjectives used to describe this word, his will. We continue in these things to go in them, to, you know, to be strengthened in them. And then we gradually begin to grow in him. And that is where true freedom lies. And true freedom is us being the living sacrifice he has called us to be, only devoted to God overcoming the temptation of the enemy. Because the enemy will come and say, oh, my dear young man, thank God you are a Christian. You know you are saved by grace, not of works. It's the grace of God that saves you. Yeah, you know, so don't be afraid to do this thing. Some people say it is sin in the sight of God, but God has saved you now. You don't need to be afraid. You know, especially you are here all alone. You are not married or your wife is away. You can, this girl that has been acting you, asking you out, you can go out with her. You are not married. At least you still need to know this girl. Are you going to just pick somebody you don't know? Still need to talk. Go out, don't worry. You are too careful. You are a young man. You have life ahead of you. This is how the enemy deceives the children of God. Or to the person that is devoted to God, that is growing in the scriptures, he knows that the Bible says, flee all appearances of evil. He knows that Solomon wrote in Proverbs, an adulterous woman will reduce you to a loaf of bread. So the person that has been following God, that knows his life is a devotion to God, with God's grace, you would see that as a temptation because it is against the will of God. It is contrary to what God has commanded. Then with God's help, you will be able to overcome even if he falls, or even that's the even when that's the beginning of his life, with God's help, God will bring him out of that. Because God's word says, if the righteous fall seven times, he will rise. It is true, it is grace that saves us, not of our works, but God's grace is saving us for us to labor and do good works for him. Because we are saved by grace, not of works, but we are going to be judged by works. 
The Bible says, if any man's work born, that person will be saved, but that's passing through fire. The evidence of us really growing in Christ is when we love him with our heart and we obey him. We love him and trust him and obey him. God will give us a greater understanding of these things. The word of God is very broad and very bright. So I encourage us, write these passages down. Romans 12, 1 and 2, John 8, 30 to 36. The whole of Romans 12. Let's read this. Let's meditate on it so that we can begin to grow. So that we can begin to grow. The Lord will help us. Let us pray briefly. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that has come. 